While working on my other project this month, my friend posted in our group chat an anime gif of a doubles mode in Tetris, where two people play on the same field to clear lines. This reminded me of an AGDQ clip where two speedrunners are playing this mode in the Grandmaster 2 arcade game. Since I'm currently taking it easy on my main project, I thought this would be a nice side project to do. Recreate the doubles mode from the Grandmaster 2. Since many of us are still in stay at home mode, I can make this networked as well so friends can join each other in online multiplayer. This video will show you my thought process and the progress I made on each step. I actually never tried making Tetris before, though I've wanted to before. I did a quick search online and there are millions of tutorials on how to make Tetris. I guess that makes sense, it's a popular game to remake on your own along with Snake, Pong, and Breakout. I chose a random tutorial to follow, and in less than 30 minutes I had a full working game as a starting base. However, I had a few problems that needed to be fixed before I can continue. First, the input only reads a button press and not a hold. This means pressing down only moves the piece down by one row, and holding down doesn't do anything. So it requires a lot of tapping to move the piece around the field, which is not very fun. Second, the architecture for where logic is handled and how data is accessed is jumbled everywhere. The pieces themselves shouldn't have input logic in them, and they shouldn't process game logic. Lastly, there's some unneeded data tracking in the grid. The playfield grid doesn't need to be updated every time the piece moves, since we can figure out the grid positions of the piece by its position. It only needs to know the blocks locked in the field. With those problems noted, I improved the architecture, fixed the input issue so holding direction buttons can smoothly move pieces, and fixed the block tracking. Now the game runs like this and is ready for features. Now that I have a good framework, it is time to lay out the features I need to add before the game feels complete. The first is to add the frame data to the game logic, so it will lock the pieces, create the next piece, and clear lines like the arcade. Second is to add the correct rotation position for the pieces. The arcade rotation works very different from modern Tetris, so I had to implement that version. Third, rotation should kick pieces to their correct position. In modern Tetris games, pieces will shift left or right when rotated in order to fit better. The arcade version has a slightly different logic for it compared to modern Tetris. Fourth, I will need to add UI polish, graphics, and sounds from the game. Fifth, I will need to handle multiple inputs from multiple devices for local multiplayer. And lastly, for online multiplayer, I will need to add network logic so players can join each other and play. With those goals in mind, I started working on rearranging the framework. I used this wiki to understand how this version of Tetris worked. It provided everything I needed to know, all the details of the frames and rotation logic, and some idea on how to create the clone of this game. I also played with the original game on an emulator to get a better feel and to compare it with my version. For the first goal, I need timers and coroutines to keep track of what frame everything is on so the timing felt right. The first hurdle was locking the frame rate. If left unchecked, Unity was running at 600 to 800 frames per second, much greater than Arcade's 60 frames per second, and it caused input to move to pieces too fast. I could do some math to match the delays, but it will complicate the code, and it's much easier to tell Unity to lock the frame rate to 60. Now that the frame rate was consistent, it was time to add timers to track the frame data. I tried using code routines for everything, but it became complicated for some things, like the lock delay that could be reset if the player moved a piece or when the player held onto a direction. There are four different frame delays. Entry delay, or ARE, determines how long it takes before the next piece appears. Delay auto shift, or DAS, is how long it takes before holding left or right will continuously move the piece, similar to how holding a key in notepad will have a delay before it repeats. The lock delay is how long it takes for a piece to lock into the board when it hits the ground. This can be reset if the piece moves to an open area before it locks. The last is the line clear delay, where the action stops for some frames when the player clears the lines. I implemented all of these with a mixture of a custom timer class and coroutines. With the frame and lock timers working, I added some quick polish and art. I created a new block texture that all the pieces use, a border texture, a background, and some quick UI to track player progress. It's already looking like a finished product, but there's more polish to be done.
The next goal was to implement rotation for the pieces. I tried rotating the whole piece itself, but with the way the Arika rotation system works, there are some special cases since this piece doesn't rotate around a single axis, but more around different positions in a 3x3 grid, or a 4x4 for the long piece. Also, the graphics would need to be rotated for each block so the shading looked correct. After thinking about it and trying to think of an elegant solution for this, I decided to hard code the rotations and the tile positions. The blocks essentially move themselves into the correct position, look correct, and the upside is each block will be ordered from top down and left to right, which will help with the kick detection. On to the third goal, kick detection. When a piece is rotated, if it can't be rotated because it would be inside other blocks, the game checks to see if it can move it to the right or left in order to be valid. This causes the piece to kick out. The wiki documents the logic on how the arcade determined whether or not the piece could rotate, so I duplicated it. I don't need to check every 3x3 block area. I only need to check the first block of the piece that intersects, since I have the blocks order from top down and left to right order, which matches the grid numbering. For the fourth step of polish, I took the sound and music from an arcade game and used an inventing system I'm using for my other game to handle playing sounds and music. It's just plug and play and everything is up and running without much effort. For the background, the original arcade game had these small animated photorealistic backgrounds for the different levels. Instead of animated videos in the back, I used photos from my trip to Japan, downsized it, and then upscaled it to give it a pixelated look to match the older resolution. I included 9 photos that will randomly cycle every time the game is played. Now it feels just like the arcade game in both gameplay and sound. Time for the fifth goal, add local multiplayer. I create the arcade game with single player only, but now I need to add local multiplayer so two people could play. Unfortunately, my original architecture ran into a problem here. But the way Unity works, when a new player connects, it will create a prefab that represents the player. Currently, my game manager reads the input, determines if the piece can move, updates the game logic, and tracks the game state. I need to create an independent controller that will handle the player input and feed that into the game logic, so I moved it out of the game manager and into the player prefab. The game manager now handles the overall state of the game instead of all the details. Using Unity's new input system, I create the default mapping for inputs and applied it to the prefab. The new system is both easy and hard to use. It's easy to quickly set up auto input detection with their input manager, and creating a prefab with the input asset for each player. It was very hard to figure out how to do the key rebinding for the separate players on local multiplayer. All the documentation assumes rebinding for a single player, or for keys to rebind the same way for both players, which wasn't what I want. With some experimenting, I developed a way to make this work by creating two copies of the input asset for the players, and applying the bindings when the game began. Now to finish the game with the title screen and menu. I wanted to recreate the box art from the original Tetris, so I created a quick scene in Blender, added some fisheye effect to make it different, and cropped it to the final version. Add in a fancy title text and a mini system, and it's complete. I gave it to some friends to playtest and added a few more changes and bug fixes based on their suggestions. Although I made the game an exact copy of the arcade, some changes would be nice to make it more modern and friendlier to play while keeping the difficulty. For example, one of them suggested a grid in the background, and a way to tell the pieces apart for each player. Once local multiplayer was working well, it was time for the last goal, online multiplayer. I used Photon since I'm most familiar with that networking asset for Unity. Overall, it took two days to add in networking logic and some testing. It was... a failure. There are syncing issues with my approach, which would cause the game to become a mess. This is something I'll have to solve next month, because I really want this part to work, and I have an idea on how to do this properly. For now, this is one goal I couldn't meet. Maybe I'll make a second video on this. The side project was supposed to be a quick one to two week project, but it took three weeks to finish. 
The prototype from the tutorial took only 30 minutes, and I spent a week polishing the game and implementing features in the original Grandmaster 2 arcade game. The next two weeks were spent implementing local multiplayer, because interplayer collisions were trickier to handle, the architecture had to be updated and redesigned to support more than one player, and I had to figure out how to get Unity to work well with multiple controllers with their new input system. Well technically, I did finish the game in a week if multiplayer wasn't added. I guess this is a good example of the 90-90 rule. The first 90% of the code accounts for the first 90% of the development time. The remaining 10% of the code accounts for the other 90% of the development time. I guess I'm going to spend the next month getting networking into this game. I might do more of these side projects, as it's fun to make something quickly and a good break from working on the same thing for months, though I might stick with single player games. Multiplayer always makes things more complicated to solve. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed seeing my progress in making this game.